Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike Young, your host, and this is our Tornado F3 special with Roy McIntyre. Roy is the highest houred F3 pilot with an astonishing 4,000 hours plus, and in this interview he chats about his training, the cockpit, wing sweep, flying on large exercises, and lots more. Remember you can help the channel to continue putting out regular quality content by becoming a patron via patreon.com forward slash aircrew interview, where you receive four different tiers, each having its own benefits. But don't forget to click the subscribe button so you don't miss any future videos. I want to thank the sponsor of this video, Dirty Bird Aero, who designed technical clothing made from aircraft parts. Their latest Mac 2 Pilots Polo shirts are made from the highest quality cotton and the sunglasses clip and buttons have been made from salvaged aluminium taken from the tail fin of Tornado F3 ZG797. Make sure you head over to their website to check them out at www.dirtybird.aero. Thank you and enjoy. When did you first become interested in aviation? From early, early days, when I was in the primary school, um, certainly by the age of 10, I knew that I wanted to be an RAF pilot. Um, and more than that, because I came from Stirling, um, I focused on 43 Squadron because they were formed in Stirling. So if you'd asked me when I was 10 years old, I knew exactly where I wanted to go, and that would be a pilot on 43 Squadron, and at that time, flying Phantoms. Simple. <laughs> so can you tell us about uh, your initial training and some of the aircraft you trained on? Okay, um, after uh, IOT I had to uh, go to Swinderby to fly the Chipmunk on the Flying Selection Squadron because I hadn't uh, done any University Air Squadron flying prior to that. Um, I, having done 14 hours on the Chipmunk I was then sent to this place here, um, 7 FTS at Church Fenton in 1983 and uh, did my JP3 basic flying training here and then the lead-in to Valley on the Jet Provost Mark mm -hmm. V and uh, got to Valley in 1985. So what was the JP like to fly? Um, the Jet Provost Mark III was generally referred to as a pig, <laughs> uh, quite, <laughs> quite advisedly. There was uh, basically constant thrust variable noise it, oh, it really before. was difficult. <laughs> it was simple, it didn't go very fast. The Mark V was a step up though. Um, mm -hmm. Pressurised cockpit, an electric canopy, which was definitely a plus on the flight line <laughs> instead of having to crank it shut, um, and obviously could go higher. Um, very forgiving and um, did the job exactly what it needed to do as mm -hmm. a basic trainer. Mm -hmm. And how long did you spend on the JP? Well, we started ground school in the autumn of 83 um, I did my first solo in January 84 and we were out of here about January 85 I think, I seem mm -hmm. to remember, some, some of that order. Mm -hmm. And after your training, did you know what aircraft you wanted to go on to? Oh yeah, Phantom. It was simple as that. And more than that, as I said when I was 10 and now I'm 20 odd in the Air Force, um, it was quite straightforward. I was going to 43 Squadron to fly Phantoms and it was like a presidential campaign throughout all my training. Um, that's where I was going. And did you get that? I did. There were a few 90 degree turns on the way, <laughs> I must be honest, but my first tour was on 43 Squadron flying Phantoms. That must have been amazing. Oh, it's perfect. So Perfect. tell us about, uh, something about your F4 training. Was it difficult coming from the JP? I mean, it's a completely yeah, different Yeah, well, the, 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 the Hawk was a reasonable step up, um, but the Phantom wasn't an easy aircraft to fly. Um, it was a classic. I wanted it in my logbook. I definitely wanted to fly it, but it's one of those aircraft you really did have to grab by the scruff of the neck, mm -hmm. particularly in the circuit. And I'll be honest, I had a shaky convex on 228 OCU at Coningsby. Mm -hmm. I was finding it difficult, and the light, the amber lights were starting to show in terms of my progress. Um, but stuck with it, and once we got onto applied flying, um, things got a lot better. But I really, really enjoyed flying it because you had to fly it. Mm -hmm. um, that said, when we got onto the Phantom on the squadron, um, quite quickly the opportunity for me to come up and transfer to the Tornado F3 came up and I didn't refuse it because that was the future. But like a classic car enthusiast, 
at least I'd had the Phantom in my logbook, just as somebody would have said, yeah, I've owned an E-Type Jag. Can't hold a candle to the latest Italian supercars, but I've had an E-Type Jag, which really counts for something. So I've flown the Phantom. Yeah. Um, so, so I really enjoyed it. So tell us what it was like to handle. I mean, that it was a, apparently a powerful aircraft. Yeah, it was all drag against thrust, um, and you had to respect it um, because it would bite uh, if you tried to do too much to it. It did talk to you, but you really did have to work at it. Um, our Phantoms, the RAF ones, were the most powerful ever built, but they were also the slowest because of the uh, Spey engines were fatter than the J79, so we had fatter intakes, we had the fat back end, which increased drag, so actually it was all just a political sop to a British industry, um, we ended up with the slowest phantoms. So to that end, you were using a lot of thrust all the time, whether it was in the circuit, whether we were up at height uh, in combat or manoeuvring, you had to work hard at it, um, which didn't really leave me much time for understanding what was going on in the radar <laughs> at the front. That was the guy in the back's job, yeah. um, to be honest. So how did the phantom fare against the types at the time? I, w I joined it when it was just starting to come off the top of the hill because the Phantom was one of the first to have a, what they called a look down, shoot down capability. Um, the radar could see low level targets, which was a big advance over the pure pulse radars of well, particularly the Lightning as far as the RAF was concerned. So it became top of the hill, it had a few um, uh, uh, increases in capability both in the weapons, it's RWR and things like that. So it really was certainly late 70s, early 80s, top of the heap. But with the coming of the F-15, F-16, there were new kids on the block and it was just starting to show its age and it relied more and more on the, the wile, wiliness and the skill of the air crew. Yeah. <laughs> I won't say dirty tricks, um, <laughs> to keep up with the, the new kids on the block. Mm -hmm. Um, so how long did you spend on the Phantom? Got onto the squadron in June 86 and uh, I, my last trip was in December 87 so really just a, a year and a half mm -hmm. and as I say when the opportunity came up to transfer across to the F3 I said yes please because that was obviously the future of air defence and the Air Force. So obviously here to talk about the F3, what, you, yeah. what were your first, first thoughts of the F3? A lot easier to fly. It was a lot cleaner, uh, slightly larger cockpit, slightly more roomy, more comfortable, everything a little bit more modern, as you'd expect. And indeed, about six months after uh, starting on the F3, in fact, just uh, after 11 Squadron went out to Cyprus, having declared, um, 228 OCU had left a Phantom behind in the hangar. So it was only six months since I last flew it, but we, we, one of us who were ex-Phantoms went into the hangar to have a look, see, and when I went up the steps and looked inside, I thought, my goodness, the black hole of Calcutta, did I actually work in that? <laughs> um, so in terms of an environment, it was a whole lot better. Yeah. Easier to fly, yet there was a little bit more, there was more performance. I don't say there's more thrust, there's more performance for it. Um, but it obviously had a major weak point at that stage and most of that was in the back cockpit and I don't mean the personnel, I mean the equipment available to the man in the back mm -hmm. um, and that's where it got most of its bad, bad publicity in mm -hmm. the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. So what squadron were you based with for your training? Right, well I was on 229 OCU which was at Coningsby and went through one of the first squadron conversion courses and uh, I was posted to 11 squadron or the new 11 squadron standing up at Leeming and in July of 1988 so I was one of the original crews the original 11 at Leeming and we moved into the hangar that's now being used by 100 squadron as the first of the three uh, Tornado F3 squadrons that moved into Leeming. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a bit about your ground training. How different was it coming from the Phantom? I mean, and how long did it take? It was about the same, and actually, because we were based at Coningsby, a lot of the ground school instructors were the ones that I saw for the Phantom they had transferred across. The training aids had improved, obviously, as, as the technology improved, etc. And yes, it was a little bit more complicated uh, in terms of what we had to take on board. Um, but in general terms, about the same length of time, mm -hmm. and, and in terms of difficulty, it's about the same, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. And at this point in time, do you think this was the future for the Royal Air Force? Yes, 
you did? Yes. I, I mean, obviously, every aircraft's got a finite life, but I knew this one was going to have quite a significant uh, period of time as being the, the, the primary air defence weapon. And at that stage, I didn't really think I would ever have a chance of being around when the typhoon comes in at that stage. So mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to get onto it and mm -hmm. hopefully stay there. So in your initial training, we have to talk about the wing sweep. Was it difficult to get used to or like how hard was that coming from the Phantom? Yeah, it, it was to begin with. There was a lot of numbers that you had to remember in your head because it's basically speed limits, um, speeds above which you cannot go in particular wing sweeps and speeds that you don't want to be below because um, it's very much like getting in the wrong gear in a car. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the aircraft had automatic wing sweep and automatic manoeuvre devices from the factory. And I actually had the opportunity of picking up on two occasions brand new aircraft from Wharton to bring them over wow. to Coningsby. At that point, the automatic wing sweep is enabled, as is the automatic manoeuvre devices. When they arrived and into the tender mercies of the RAF engineers, it was disabled. Why was it disabled? Well, at the time, they didn't really have a proper fatigue monitoring, monitoring programme. Um, and so the easy way is to say, well, let's not do that. Let's just disable it until we can work it out. Um, in the end, and I think it came from the OEU, they said, do you know what? We don't really need it. So it never came back. Mm -hmm. But the point is, I have had an opportunity to use the automatic wing sweep. And it is very similar to being in a car with an automatic gearbox or a manual gearbox. For the average driver, you can get quite a lot out of the car, manual gearbox, uh, the automatic gearbox, but to get the best out of it, you really want to have a manual gearbox. And this aircraft, I believe, was the same. You work the wing sweep much like you change gears in the car, mm -hmm. and the automatic manoeuvres, well, the manoeuvring devices, not automatic, were on my thumb on my left hand, and it was just down to the skill of the pilot to get the aircraft configured as it needed to be for wherever you were. Mm -hmm. and, and that was quite a challenge, but it was very satisfying. Mm -hmm. But it did take some of my capacity away. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why you would say, well, automatic wing sweep surely would release more capacity for the pilot. Yes, but it didn't quite react as quickly as the pilot can. So therefore, for absolute pure performance, you would want, I would say you'd want the manual wing sweep. So I quite enjoyed it. So do you think uh, the pilots would have benefited on the front line from the automatic wing sweep in general, or do you think everyone was different? The average pilot would probably have done better. Mm -hmm. um, other air forces that used it did have automatic wing sweep and they benefited from it. Mm -hmm. But I believe that a, a pilot that knows the airframe will get more out of it using manual wing sweep and manual manoeuvre devices mm -hmm. but it um, can get you wrong and the first F3 that we lost and, and tragically the pilot was killed was because he was in the wrong wing sweep. Ah uh, yeah I've heard that before. The wing sweep was actually infinite so you could put it anywhere but to make it easy because we had to remember numbers there were really four there was 25 wing which is fully forward effectively um, we used 35 occasionally, and then 45, 57, and 67 as well. Oh, 57. I've yeah, now that came in when we had tanks on because, right. no, sorry, that was 63. 63 yeah, yeah, you are pushing my memory now. <laughs> 63 when the big tanks were on, etc. Yeah. Um, I know why I got 57, because there's 570 knots is one of them was the limit. We had two figures, you've got the ab you know, indicated airspeed or the Mach number, yeah. whichever came into play. Um, 0 0.73, 350 knots, I think was the limiting speed for 25. And then it was like 450, oh, you really are. It's yeah. I'll, I'll just say now, it's, <laughs> 10, it's 10 years since I last <laughs> touched the thing. Um, and then we came back to 630. 630, I think it was a 670. Mm, can't remember when it was fully back with, but of course then we had limiting speeds with tanks or was it clean as well? So mm -hmm. obviously when there's no tanks on, you were, our speed was way up. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the underwing tanks had 1.2 Mach limit, whereas that was the 2250s, the 1500s weren't supersonic, but they had a higher G limit and it was mm -hmm. all sorts of bits and pieces. 
So did the wing sweep, like you were saying earlier, did it become like second nature? Yeah, just like absolutely. When you're flying? Yeah. It's just like driving a car, and you just got that feeling. I'm in the wrong gear, mm -hmm. or I need to change gear. Um, it's cri it was critical mm -hmm. to get maximum performance, whether you're trying to accelerate, or indeed when you need to start turning, mm -hmm. because if you're trying to turn hard and your wings are too far back. It's like being too slow in too high a gear. Mm -hmm. The aircraft's losing energy, it's getting near the stall, um, and you're not winning. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that you have the wings in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And more than that, the automatic maneuver, uh, well, so the maneuvering devices that should have been automatic, um, the leading edge slats and the flaps just came down ever so slightly. If you didn't need them down, that's drag. Which mm -hmm. you couldn't afford, yeah, because we, we never had enough power or enough <laughs> thrust or enough energy in the F3. So you were trying to save it all the time. Yeah. Uh, did you have a sim before your first flight? Oh yes. Well, there was a quite a comprehensive simulator program. Um, they also had what they call a C pit, you know, cockpit procedures trainer, which was basically static. All the lights came on, switches could work, and the instructor could make captions come on to simulate emergencies. So you could practice drills. But then we had the mission simulator. Uh, didn't have motion, didn't have vision to begin with, but that basically was fairly full functional front and rear cockpit. Mm -hmm. So we could in fact fly um, a mission, give the uh, navigator a chance to fly some intercepts and then introduce some emergencies, etc., and recover back to base. So all the displays were giving us real world type information. And it was quite a, a uh, a comprehensive program on the work up towards first trip on the OCU itself. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about your first trip. Can you remember it and can you describe this for us? Yes. Um, it was Paul Burnside, squad leader Paul Burnside, QFI with me. Um, I can't really remember too much about it other than I remember it was him because he then joined us on 11 Squadron as the uh, uh, squadron QFI. But the acceleration down the runway was more than the Phantom was. Um, getting airborne just completely different, much closer to the Hawk in its style. Okay. It almost felt a little bit lighter, controls much more balanced and easier to fly than the Phantom. So I would imagine those who followed me coming through the Hawk to the Tornado S3 would see quite an easy step. Mm -hmm. So how did the F3 handle, like what was its strengths and weaknesses? Yeah, the, when it first came out, there was obviously a, a spin statement that came from MOD down to the senior officers that said, you are to say this aircraft is a delight to fly. <laughs> and I have to admit, it was. It was a delight to fly. If you were just thinking about flying it around the circuit, flying it through the sky, um, it did exactly that. And it, it was a delight to fly. It was a reasonable cop. We still had two thicker... Uh, cockpit uh, canopy arch in front of me um, but it was better than the Phantom in terms of visibility and general comfort uh, it was just a nice office to be in mm -hmm. but in terms as I hinted already um, at that stage it's not there just to fly around the air it's there to do a job and that's where the problems were at that mm -hmm. stage this is very crudely related to the Ed, uh, the Ed display variant <laughs> yes is that with Norma? Yeah, it's it's not a near display. I mean, the guys who have displayed it through the seasons have put on tremendous displays, but they have to work hard. The aircraft has to be light in terms of fuel load, and there's an awful lot of reheat, which of course the crowds like, but right. you need it for the performance. Yeah. It is not an F-16, it is not a Typhoon, it's not an F-15, etc., etc., in terms of its, or any of the Russian stuff. Um, you have to work hard to make it uh, mm -hmm. there. But air display, in its early days, it had limited operational capability, mm -hmm. which caused quite a ruction within the F3 force between those who had been on the Phantom before, coming off a very mature operational platform, to perhaps the younger guys who were seeing this as their first tour, and seeing their platform not operating as well as it should, but also hearing all the time from those who had been on the Phantom, oh, when I was on the Phantom it used to do that, and, and it caused a lot of friction to begin with. So. Yeah, we weren't actually, we didn't have a lot of credibility, to be honest. Of course, yeah, but that grew in time. Yeah. But uh, let's talk about the cockpit. How, 
how different was it coming from the Phantom? Because the Phantom, I've been in a Phantom cockpit, it seems very cramped and yep. switches everywhere, but Abs this seems a bit more laid out. Yeah, absolutely right. And that's what you'd expect from a more modern design. Um, literally more arm room. The light grey colour of the cockpit helped tremendously as opposed to the oh, black really? of the uh, Phantom. As I say, you look inside the Phantom and you think, oh, it's a black hole of Calcutta. Whereas <laughs> this is a bit more airy. I could see the back seater quite easily by turning round. It was just generally more usable mm -hmm. all round and the switches were nicely laid out. We eventually got a new stick top. The first one was a little bit crude. There wasn't much hotas as you call it now, um, a little bit, but um, that came later. But in terms of, of operating it, it was a very comfortable environment. Mm -hmm. And was it mainly analog, wasn't it? Was it was, I think yeah. it was one glass screen? Or? Yep, I had one. Um, obviously, we had a head-up display, which yep. was good, but I had one um, the, uh, in front, and then there was two in the back, and I could select the picture source of either BBC One or BBC Two, depending on what the <laughs> nav was doing, um, to, to look at that on the um, mm -hmm. electronic head-down display I had in mm -hmm. front. Laterally, there was another independent display, but that's much further down the road. Mm -hmm. And again, I've sat in a Phantom cockpit and also a Tornado F3 cockpit, and the throttle just seems like a leap forward, even the way it feels. The Phantom yeah. feels very primitive. Yeah. Yes. Um, and the other thing was we had a fundamental opposite motion in the, th in the throttles between the F4 or the Phantom and the Tornado, and it caught a few people out. Oh, right. uh, in as much as to select reheat in the Phantom, you had to rock them forward rock them outboard yeah. and then forward through a gate. You did that on the F3, you put the thrust reverses out. Wow, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> you go forward and then to go into reheat, it's just through the detent mm -hmm. and just continue pushing them forward. Mm -hmm. You rock them outboard, the buckets come out and you slow down quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's weight on wheel switches that stop it happening in the air, yeah. supposed to stop it happening in the air. Mm -hmm. But um, on the runway, I didn't witness it myself, but I did hear of people getting a little bit confused at the moment critique, <laughs> and instead of taking it up, they're suddenly slowing down very quickly. Yeah. So obviously the thrust reverses were quite unique to an aircraft at yes. that time. Um, did you deploy them every time you landed? Yes. Uh, normally, assuming that uh, they hadn't failed, um, or you'd had a, some sort of indication of a problem, it was the normal way to, to stop. The brakes were better than the Phantom. The Phantom wheel brakes were rubbish because, of course, the Phantom was designed to land on the carrier yeah. and you don't need um, brakes on the, uh, wheel brakes on the carrier. So they had a hook and or the, the, well, mainly the chute. Mm -hmm. uh, the wheel brakes had very good anti-skid system on them, so it was possible to land with your feet hard on the brakes. Wow. You can pre-arm the thrust reverse so that when the weight on wheel switches are activated by the main gear touching the runway, the thrust reverse could come out. The danger is the nose would then come down quite hard, but if you then put the throttle up, you could stop quite quickly. The idea being if the runway was damaged, bomb craters, etc. Um, typically, I think the best one would be about 1,500 feet okay. to stop in, but the brakes are smoking and the tyres won't last very long. Yeah, um, so it. they used to do that for the air display in the early days. We wouldn't routinely do that, there was yeah. no point. And indeed, there were certain limitations on us pre-arming the thrust reverse. Normally it would be land, nose wheel down, everything under control, right, now bring the thrust reverse out. And then perversely, well, just like airliners, you bring the throttle up to slow down, which took a little bit to get used to. You know? <laughs> so, uh, on the throttle, was it literally min reheat and then a, a yeah. point in between? It was... Takeoff was always full reheat. There was a stage beyond that called combat, um, where effectively you were over temperaturing the engines, but just getting a little bit of thrust. Mm. It's that harks back to the Battle of Britain and the Merlins with their boost yeah. buttons, etc. Um, we were allowed 10 minutes in the hour with the combat. Uh, it gave us that little bit extra. We didn't routinely use that unless we were heavy. Mm -hmm. And by heavy, by the big tanks, fully armed, Northern QRA or QRA was a combat takeoff. Mm -hmm. Or where it got hot. And of course, we did go places where it got hot later on. Mm -hmm. um, but normally it was full reheat. Um, for takeoff, but we wouldn't just slam it in. We'd sit at the end of the runway, run the engines up, and towards 
about halfway through its life, the engineers uh, discovered that if we recorded certain figures, they could predict engine failure. So it took us about 30 seconds at the end of the runway. Um, well, the, I read out some temperatures and RPMs to the nav, note them down, give them to the engineers, they would plot it, and uh, if something kind of deviated, they would go, oh, we better just have a look at that engine. Mm -hmm. um, but they would do that, and then when we're happy, into min reheat, just make sure the burner's light, I can see the indications inside, um, temperatures and the nozzle movement, and then up to full reheat, and we'd go mm -hmm. at that point. So, uh, why have a tornado man here? I've never yeah. seen a tornado take off without reheat. Could, is it possible to take off with, you know, uh, if, clean? The, if the runway's long enough, you know, <laughs> and curvature of the earth and all that sort of... Um, no, generally if you lose one of the burners, depending on when it happens, you would normally reject the takeoff mm -hmm. and go right. back round. Um, it would have to be quite a long runway for yeah. it to get away. No, mm -hmm. the, the dry thrust is not enough. Not enough. Yeah. So let's talk about the radar. Obviously, it was uh, had a blue circle in quotes there. But yes. uh, was the radar good uh, by the time you came onto it? It was getting there. I would say it wasn't as good in a, with a capable operator, 1988, it still wasn't as good as the Phantom. Mm -hmm. And that was saying something, because that's a radar that pretty much dated from the early 70s. But very quickly, and, and the, the, the OEU throughout its entire life was one of its main projects, was improving the radar. Mm -hmm. Now, it was never going to get medium PRF, which without going into the technicalities, there is an, a weak area, physical weak area, that the, air, that the radar wouldn't be able to see targets in. But low PRF, high PRF, um, and the software that was driving it was constantly being upgraded. And very quickly, I would say within about three or four years, given the choice, which airframe would I take to war if I had to go to war, it very quickly became the F3. Really? Yeah. Wow. There were some other things to come into play, not least of which was its RHWR radar homing and warning receiver, which was excellent from the start really? and only got better. Yeah. Through its adaptability and its accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not au fait with what the Typhoon has, mm -hmm. but the F3 at the end, its RHWR, was one of its best. I think the assets. F3 at the end of its life was a really capable jet. Oh, yes. Really I, I mean, it still had a, didn't have medium PRF. It had the same weapon system that the Typhoon had, capable of supporting the AMRAM through mid course guidance. It had data link the JTIDs Link 16, and I say the RHWR. The displays were still monochromatic, green. Yeah. There was talk of getting colour displays. It was a question of cost versus the utility. And I don't think the air crew, of which I would have to count myself as being one as guilty, really made enough of a case to the bean counters to say it was worthwhile. Yeah. We kind of said, yeah, and they looked at it and went, well, they're not really shouting about it enough. Mm -hmm. um, we had symbology changes, etc., etc., which enabled us to get a lot more information, but it was still looking at a green, mm -hmm. an old green screen, etc. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but we had a lot of information. We had secure radio, we had anti-jam radios, we had secure comms through data link. We were in a good place. We had uh, laser ring gyros, very accurate, so our kit, from the start was a little bit at variance with yeah. reality and towards the end we were we had high confidence in knowing where we were and of course we had an NVG capability which was very good as well. <laughs>